And to be like him is something we should strive to do each day. And uh, surrendering all is where it takes place. And what a beautiful song. So thank you, choir. Thank you, Shannon and uh, Brenda, Lydia. You guys are so faithful to uh, help uh, begin our time of worship. And so, um, and as we worship God, as we continue in this time of, of worship, um, we come to our time in the service where we give our tithes and offerings. And of course, we are continuing to give uh, with the buckets on the ground. So here on the floor, we have locations in the middle and the back, and we have a location up in the balcony as well. And so as Christ was faithful in his giving, in his life, I pray that we would be faithful in giving back to him through our tithes and offerings this morning. God, we thank you for today. And Lord, what a humbling experience it has been and what a humbling experience it continues to be. God, to enter into your presence, enter into a time of, of worship, God. How, how unworthy, beginning with me, how unworthy are we to worship you, God? We are, we, we are worthy, but Jesus made us worthy. Jesus called us. Have we responded? Did we respond? And if we have, we have been made righteous. And with our life, our life should be that of dedication, that of service. And so as we give this morning, let us give with an expectation that God is going to take what is given and multiply it. So that this world can know the good news of the gospel so that this world can see the good news of the gospel lived out in our lives. So bless over this offering, God, and let, let our church use it in a way that honors and glorifies you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning. Just want to say I love, love, love this song that I'm going to sing. And um, it actually really pierced my soul last fall because I think it's like a fall song. It's with all creation. I sing the Revelation song and everybody knows it. And um, I was down at the creek and I happened to, and I was always singing down there. That's my serenity now. And I happened to notice a beautiful maple tree, leaves half on, half off, sun shining perfectly on that tree, just a touch of coolness in the air. That's all I like, just a touch, um, touch of coolness in the air. And I was looking at that tree, and it was just almost like the branches were just praising the heavens, praising Christ. And I was like, wow. That is incredible. That is, that's such a gift, Lord. Thank you. And just validates that Christ is real. And um, so anyway, this year when I told Shannon, I was like, I really want to sing that song around fall. And um, so I'm kind of looking around as I'm practicing. Well, I'm not seeing that same vision that I saw last year. And God told me, he said, be still and know that I'm God. So I thought, you know what? We need to be still. I always get myself choked up for almost saying. <laughs> okay, here we go.
Thank you so much. What a wonderful song to sing, the Revelation song. God leaves us speechless. God leaves us in wonder and awe of his majesty and his glory. Thank you for sharing again. So today, we're going to be partaking in the Lord's Supper, communion, something we do every so often here at Enon, and it allows us to remember. And as we focus on one of the greatest ordinances in the church, first established by Jesus at the Last Supper, we remember many things. Our memories not only connect us to the past, but prepares us for the future and what God has in store for us. On November 29th of 2020, Pastor Jeff entrusted me with one of the greatest privileges I've had since being here at Enon, which was to conduct my first solo communion. I'm not going to say that he threw me under the bus, but uh, he had a lot of faith and trust in me that day. He needed to spend some time with family. In fact, speaking of trust, there's two types of trust in the world, and one has to do with giving an order of food to your waitress and trusting that the, the, the kitchen cooks your steak to the right temperature. And there's a second type of trust, a trust that you might have in a bungee cord right before you take that jump or leap of faith. And needless to say, the bungee cord held tight for me that day, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity. But when I look back, I had trust in Pastor Jeff to teach me what to do because of his trust in the Lord. But Pastor Jeff also had trust in me because of my trust in the Lord. We both trusted the process because of our reliance and who it fell upon, which was the only one that is reliable, Jesus. Our trust was the only our trust was in the only one who was trustworthy. And you, if you fast forward from that point to August 29th of this year, Pastor Jeff led his congregation, not only in his final message, but he led his congregation in his final communion with us as well. Pastor Jeff's last supper with us. And now, we hear, uh, now we're here again two months later. As I stand here today, and as we prepare to take part in our first communion since Pastor Jeff's passing, remembrance today will hit closer to home more than ever. But today and every day, the doors of this church are open. We are called to remember who and what gave Pastor Jeff purpose. And who and what gives us purpose and drives the gospel through us to this lost and dying world? Because the gospel goes on. Even though we may pass on in life, the gospel is taken and has been going strong. It is the most popular story all throughout history. Because there is hope in the gospel. There is a finality to the gospel because we can finally be free from the bondage of sin and darkness in our life because of Jesus. And so today we remember that. The who is Jesus and the what is his sacrifice that was made on the cross 2,000 years ago for you, for me, for all those who are willing, not forced, 
but motivated by the one who is worthy to be praised. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. And Lord, you don't, you don't just meet us on a Sunday in the morning or in the afternoon or maybe a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. Lord, if we know you through a relationship, God, you are with us wherever we go. And so we're not going to invite your presence in here today because you are already here with us. Dwelling in our hearts, God. Motivating us by love. Motivating us by truth. And the truth comes from the one who claimed to be the truth, the way, the sacrifice. And we cannot come to you, a perfect and holy God, without going first through the one who claimed to be that way, which is Jesus. And today we remember that. We partake in the, the Lord's Supper today. Not only are you in our memory, but you are alive and well seated at the right hand of the Father. God, thank you for the continual remembrance that we have within you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 today. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And um, here in just a moment when we read that, um, this is our focal passage, but we're also going to be reading some, uh, we are also going to be reading the verses surrounding these key verses as well, because we want to understand the broader context of what was going on what was actually happening in the church at Corinth to cause Paul, the Apostle Paul, to write this particular section, this particular chapter to the church. And so all those who are able, please stand and, uh, as we read God's inerrant and infallible word together. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 26. For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given things, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup, after saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, you may be seated. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. And so today, the message, of course, is entitled, um, Do This in Remembrance, or as the table here says, this do in remembrance. And there's so many ways that we can formulate this, but the whole idea is that we remember. We remember, and when we see this, when we see this table, it's more than than just a table, it's more than a phrase. It's, It's our mindset, our mentality, because our life is dependent on us always remembering and never forgetting. Because the moment that we forget what Jesus did for us, is the moment that we take for granted the greatest gift we have ever received. And so we are to not forget, but to always remember and to be urgent in that remembering. Communion began at the Last Supper as Jesus ate his last meal with his disciples before going to the cross. This was Jesus' way of showing the disciples the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. 
the Jewish Passover was finalized through the Last Supper, showing that the blood of the perfect lamb, being Jesus' blood, would cover the sins of the believers. And as we remember in Exodus, before the children of Israel departed or exited uh, Egypt, they had the Passover during the last plague. And in order to protect their family, they had to shed the blood of a, of a perfect lamb and put it on the doorpost of their door so that their oldest child would not perish, would not die. And the only ones that knew what to do, the only ones that knew the proper procedure was the children of Israel because they had a covenant with the Lord. They made a covenant with God and so that he would pass over if the perfect lamb's blood was not only shed but covered. And so we too had a lamb, the lamb, capital T, capital H, capital E, the lamb that was slain for us, Jesus. And through his blood, he covers us. And so that one, way, one day when we stand before God, he sees that sacrifice and he passes over, meaning by that his judgment passes over us. It, it doesn't apply to us anymore. Even though we are still unworthy of that gift, it is still a gift. And God honors his promises. God honors his covenants that he makes. And Jesus was establishing a new covenant with his disciples that they could take, 11 of them could take, when the first church started, so that generation after generation, a new covenant, not bound by law, not bound by the 300 and something laws that the Jewish theocracy had to deal with, or the thousands of laws that the Pharisees added on top of that, but so that the law was fulfilled, and that no longer are we bound by rules, but we are bound bound by the ruler because of the promise of Jesus and because of what he did the Jewish tradition would no longer be needed because the gap between heaven and earth would finally be bridged because of Christ this was no ordinary meal though this would be the beginning of a church ordinance and ordinance is an extremely important word because this is not a tradition this isn't just something we do because we like to do it, or it seems nice. This is an ordinance. This is given by Jesus. He said, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. And that continues even today in the Christian church. This is not the physical body and blood of Jesus, as some people believe takes place. But this is the physical representation of the body and blood of Jesus. So what took place on that cross, which caused the spiritual and what causes the spiritual regeneration within our hearts to come to Christ. Although taking communion doesn't save you, we are called to remember where our faith in God began, which was Jesus. The same works for baptism. This doesn't save you, but it's a symbol in a public proclamation, a declaration of our belief in Christ. And that's why we are called Baptists. I'm sure we could have been called the Communionists, but that just sounds too much like another party we won't talk about today. But let's take a quick look at the surrounding verses so we can understand a better, uh, in, in a better way the context in which Paul wrote these verses to the church at Corinth. So if you would back up with me in chapter 11 and verse beginning in verse 17. It says, "But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you." Paul called out churches called out people not so in a con in a condemning way but he called people out to know that their heart was in the wrong place paul called people out because he if we look back in first corinthians and in, in the first chapter 
he points out that there are divisions among people, whether it's different groups in the church or uh, segmented by class or maybe race or um, w- whatever the case is, there were divisions. It didn't matter what exactly they were, but they were there. They were dividing the church up. And he continues to point out that even in, in the Lord's Supper, the moment that we are, to, are called to remember what Jesus did, we can only think about ourselves. And that's what the people were doing here. And it says, and I believe in part, I believe in it part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. In verse 20, it says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Mm. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. And Paul calls out what was going on here. There was a division, particularly in this church, when it came to the Lord's Supper, between rich and poor those that came to the, to the supper, the, the ones, it was almost like a, a potluck. It was a meal. It was a communal type of thing. It, is, it wasn't practiced in the first church the way that we practice it today. They had a full-fledged meal together. But there was people that could afford to bring food, and there was people that couldn't afford, rich and poor. The rich group had the ability to bring food, and so they did. And so when the poor came, they would eat and partake. But the rich didn't like that. They didn't get what they wanted to get out of it. And so what happened was they started coming early to the Lord's Supper. And and what, what did it say that they did? They would get drunk. They would overeat. They would they would eat until they're full. They were trying, church, to meet a physical need in their life or physical want because what did they say that they got drunk well what happens when you how do you get drunk you have an excess of something that you don't need of alcohol an excess causes drunkenness and so they overate they drank they came in early because they didn't want the poor to come in and take their food but they still wanted to participate in the lord's supper but to them they weren't honoring it in the way that Jesus initially intended it, and so Paul was calling them out. He was saying, I cannot believe what you are doing. Shall I commend you in this? You are not partaking in the Lord's Supper. You are dishonoring. This is irreverent to God, to Jesus, and the sacrifice that he made. The remembrance part comes with breaking the bread as a symbol that we remember. That's what Jesus said, that we remember what he did. That, that's on his physical body, but and it's on his physical blood, but we drink it and we eat it as a remembrance. Not to be filled. This isn't a, a pre-lunch snack today. This is remembering what Jesus did on the cross for us. And so Paul called them out. Paul got righteously angry at what this church and what these people, these, this particular group of people were doing. How today are we doing that? Well, we'll get into the repercussions of that here in just a moment. But if we continue on, in verse 23 it says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when, uh, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance remembering remembering people that are close to you each year you don't just remember you celebrate people's birthdays you don't just remember certain holidays you you celebrate them you you remember by doing something that shows that there is a celebratory aspect to it we are proclaiming 
the body of Jesus that was broken. We are proclaiming the blood that was shed, but we are more than just declaring, we are celebrating. Because without that, church, we would be destined for an eternity separated from God. And so remembering, remember, remember. Not a distant thought, but something close that we keep to our heart each day. And in the same way, he also took the cup after saying, or after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus' new covenant was established here in this place, in that room. Do this as often as you drink it. And I'm, I want to pause there because it says, as often as you decide to do this. Now, us as, as Enonites, we celebrate and we partake in the, in the Lord's Supper communion on the fifth Sunday of each month that has a fifth Sunday. So it works out to be about four, maybe five times at the most a year that we celebrate. And I know we do it on occasion in between that here and there, depending on the holiday. But we do it as a time to remember. But Jesus is saying, as often, as often as we do this, well, it doesn't say when we have to do it, how often we have to do it, but that we do it, that we remember, that we partake in the Lord's Supper. Again, this is a, an ordinance. This is not a, a joke. This isn't a frivolous activity. If we come before this as such, then we would be just like this church in Corinth who abused the privilege it is to honor Christ through taking communion. As often as we drink it. It's a daily reminder. The fact that we can wake up and breathe. That Jesus is alive. Because he is the one that gave us the breath of life. But we do this as often as we drink or eat. In remembrance of Jesus. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup. You proclaim the Lord's death. Until he comes. We proclaim it. We proclaim God's death through his son Jesus on the cross. We proclaim that. Not just to fellow believers, but to the world. And not that just some random person died. But the God of heaven stepped down from, from heaven into earth so that you and I could be re renewed and regenerated and made righteous before a perfect and a holy God. And so we, we do these things to cry out to God and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. And so it continues in verse 27, and it says, whoever, therefore, eats the bread, and this section is very familiar because we talk about this each time we take communion. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Notice that it didn't say those who take of the Lord's Supper who are unworthy, who are unworthy. It didn't say unworthy of the person doing it. It said in an unworthy manner. Well, the manner in which, it, uh, which was unworthy was mentioned in verses 17 through 22, that people were abusing they're, the time that they had, they weren't recognizing, they weren't truly remembering and honoring Christ through his sacrifice. They did it so that they could fill their stomachs, so that they could get drunk and have a party. It's not about filling a physical need, but to remember the greatest spiritual need that was ever met in our life, in my life, because of Jesus. And so he goes on to say, let a person, and we, we see this word every time, let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. In verse 31 it continues, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. And then verse 33 and 34 
it wraps up what Paul is trying to get across in these last two verses of this chapter. So then, my brothers, when you, and the word you there, when it, when it says you in these last two verses, it means you all, y'all. So there's some southern lingo in God's word, and I'm thankful for that. But it says, so then, my brothers, when y'all come together to eat, wait for one another. Wait. This is the unworthy manner in which the church at Corinth were abusing the Lord's Supper. He said, wait. Don't come early, because it's not about you being filled. Come together at the same time. Wait for those who can't afford to bring food, so they can too partake within this supper. In verse 34, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. If you want to feel a physical need, stay in the place where you can. If you want to feel a spiritual need, come to the place that you can get it. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I come. And so I want to present to you guys, I want to ask you a question. Are we worthy to partake of communion? I don't want you to answer. I want you to just think. Are we worthy? And the answer to that question is emphatically no. We are not worthy. But Jesus was and is worthy. He is what gives us the righteousness that we need. The worthiness comes from Jesus himself. It doesn't come from us. And so when we take of the communion cup and bread today, remember that we are not worthy, but we are to take it in a worthy manner that when we come together, we take it properly, that we recognize the whole reason for communion, which is to remember. And the reason why we know that, that a that the Lord's Supper can be served, even when people are unworthy, is because at the Last Supper, Jesus, around a table of his disciples, 12 disciples, was a man that was getting ready to betray Jesus with a kiss for some, for some cash, for some money. There was a man getting ready to deny him three times. One of his his greatest disciples would deny him, betray, deny, and then one just doubted him, doubted his divinity, doubted who he was. But Jesus still served the bread because he knew they weren't worthy, but Jesus was. Jesus served the very first communion. He served the cup despite the fact that they were unworthy to the disciples because not this tradition but this ordinance given to us by Jesus himself is called to be remembered as often as we come together as a body of believers as often as we come together and recognize what Jesus did for us on the cross People often ask the question, how much does God love me? And we see the picture on the cross. We see Jesus and his hands nailed to that cross, to that tree. And as far as the east is from the west, that's how much Jesus loves us. Guys, the east doesn't meet the west. His love is never ending. It never fails. But one thing that we also do forget sometimes is that Jesus didn't just reach out his arms in love left to right east to west he reached his arms top to bottom that as as fully God and fully man he reached down from heaven into earth he didn't grab us up and say you're coming with me no that would be unloving there's choice when it comes to love Jesus reached down from heaven to earth to extend a hand have you accepted that hand have you accepted christ into your life has there been a time where you experience that love that east to west love but that north to south experiential love where we where we don't just know about the love of jesus we experience when we when he reaches his hand out to us and we grab hold because 
he is the only one worthy of grabbing hold of. We grab a hold of so many things in this life. I mean, the, the church was getting drunk. The church was overeating. The church was doing these things, dishonoring and disrespecting God. We, we have done enough dividing in our country. We have done enough dividing in this world. Why do we continue it in the church? Why do we divide? Why do we make a mockery of a holy God, a righteous God? It's because we don't fear the one who will have ultimate judgment upon us. Do you fear God today? And if you fear God, it, the beginning of anything, knowledge, comes from the fear of God. The beginning of your walk with Christ comes from the fear of the Lord, a healthy fear, a trembling fear that we fall on our hands and knees before God and as the ladies play, we're going to have a quick time of response. And then we're going to get to our time of communion together. But I would ask you the question, if, if everyone would stand. I would ask the question, are you worthy? <laughs> no, of course not. Of course not. We are, none of us are worthy. We are not worthy to stand before God. But through Jesus, we have been made worthy. And through the sacrifice of his body and his blood, we are able to take communion today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I, I would ask the question, is there anybody in here, anyone in here that has never experienced, had that experiential knowledge of a relationship with Jesus, would there be anyone that would raise their hand and say, that, that's me. I never gave my life to the Lord. And I want to do that today. Is there anyone in here this morning that just needs prayer? Maybe you're going through a loss. Maybe you're going through a time of, of sickness or disease and you just need prayer. Would you just slip up your hand? I see that hand. I see that hand all over the house. I see those hands. I see that hand. God is watching over every one of you. Those that are watching online, God is watching over all of us. Are we coming before him in a worthy manner, in a way that honors the remembrance of Jesus? God, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the cross. God, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, he could have, he could have tagged out at any time. He could have said, nope, I, I, I can't do it. And that question arose, but Jesus was greater he was stronger he conquered death he conquered hell he conquered that grave and he rose again and God thank you and as we remember today who you were God as we read in scripture but who you are today right now who you are you are on high seated at the right hand of the father Lord, we are so unworthy. But thank you for Jesus who made us worthy. God, I pray for those that raise their hands. Whatever situation they are dealing with, God, I pray that you would have your way in their life, Lord. We know your answer isn't always easy. We know your way isn't always pleasant. But God, we know the end result that if we know you, we will spend eternity with you. And no matter what we face here on this side of heaven, God, that we are insured by you because of that body, because of that blood. Lord, be with us today in these next few moments as we take communion together. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated, and um, as the deacons come forward,
we will begin our time. And again, those that are watching online, if you um, would like to continue um, watching with us and partake in communion, we would strongly encourage you uh, to do so. We thank you so much for your presence with us this morning so far. But as an ordinance of the church, as we talked about, we'll be doing our communion today. This is an open communion, meaning you don't have to be a member of Enon Baptist Church to participate, but you must be a believer in Jesus Christ, having uh, genuinely repented of your sins and placing your faith in Jesus alone for salvation. We are also to never take communion in an unworthy manner, as today we found out the unworthy manner in which the church at Corinth took it. Take it serious, guys. It's not, a waif- it's not just a wafer. It's a way for us to remember Jesus. And the, the cup is not just a drink. It's for us to remember the blood that it took for you and I to be saved. Take it seriously. And so I'd ask everyone to to bow their heads and take a moment to examine your heart. Make sure that you are coming to this communion table as a body of believers in a worthy manner, that you are taking serious this ordinance given by Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this time, for this opportunity to partake in communion. As unworthy as we are, we still thank you for allowing us to remember, to go through this ceremony. Because of what Jesus did, Lord, let us come And take this seriously. And if we're not willing to do that, I pray that we would not take communion today, but that we would honor you either by not doing it or honoring you by following through this ordinance in a serious, in a reverent way. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as we we get ready for uh, communion, As usual, we have been using a different cup. You guys will come up, and there is a small film at the very top in which you will take it, uh, remove it, and there you will find your wafer, and that it will be the first piece of the communion in a larger tab just underneath that for the cup. Um, Those that are in the balcony, um, if you guys would go ahead and stand up and come down this aisle, and then we will have one of the, one of the deacons um, on this side take you guys uh, down the right, my right, your left aisle, all the way back up, coming through, and exiting back out this aisle. Um, so those that are in the balcony, if you guys would go ahead and start heading this way, and then we will have a deacon over here on my right uh, start to exit the aisles as they come down as well.
Has everybody been served? Thank you, ladies. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three and 24, it says, For I have received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the promise of the broken body of Jesus Christ for us. Lord, although no bone was broken as it was prophesied, Jesus' body was disfigured horribly to the point of being unrecognizable. The punishment that he endured before the cross was it enough to take his life? And so let us not forget the body that was broken, that bore the, the crown of thorns upon his head for us. So let us remember as we take this bread, the body that was broken. For us in Jesus' name. Amen. The body of Jesus broken for you. Take and eat. Please go ahead and gently remove the larger tab just underneath that. First Corinthians eleven twenty five 25 and 26 says, In the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the blood that was shed. Lord, everything in the Old Testament when it came to sacrifices took a perfect, a spotless lamb, ultimately pointing to the spotless lamb, to the perfect sacrifice, which we find in Jesus. And so without the, the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so it took every ounce of Jesus' blood on that cross, in agony for us to be redeemed. Let us remember the sacrifice and the purpose that we now have because of it and the life that we can now live to be more like the one who gave us his all. In Jesus' name, amen. The blood of Jesus shed for you. Take and drink. Through this taking of communion, we remember what Christ did for us on the cross while anxiously awaiting his glorious return for his bride. I'm now going to ask Shannon to come up and lead a verse of blessed be the tie that binds. So church family, if you would stand as we sing. Once we are done singing, you are dismissed. And I thank you so much for your attentiveness, for the worthy manner in which we took God's Supper today, the Lord's Supper, communion. Blessed be.